This is Joe Worshba in Gastonia, North Carolina, 18 miles west of Charlotte, 8 miles north of the South Carolina border. Population, 30,000, 85% white, 15% Negro. A big textile center, Gastonia calls itself the Spindle City and the city of growing beauty. It has a good record of race relations. We move 881 miles south to reporter Ed Scott. This is the Cane River on whose banks the city of Natchitoches, Louisiana was built, Ed. It's the oldest town in the Louisiana Purchase, having had its roots in 1714. It's traditionally and culturally southern in mood. It has a population today of 12,000 persons, almost half of whom are Negroes. The Negroes of Natchitoches are distinguished by a controversial statue in the town square. Erected in grateful recognition of the arduous and faithful services of the good darkies of Louisiana. Otherwise, the almost 6,000 citizens of Natchitoches observe the normal relationship of white to Negro. Like Gastonia, it has a good record in race relations. This is the Supreme Court of the United States. For 165 years, its sacred trust has been to rule on and interpret the law of the land as embodied in the Constitution. Equal justice under the law. On May 17, this court ruled unanimously that segregation in public schools was not legal. Tonight, See It Now devotes its entire half hour to an effort to reflect the opinions and attitudes of certain persons who live in Gastonia, North Carolina, and in Nagatash, Louisiana. So as not to interrupt this program, we ask you first to look at this report from Alcoa, our sponsors, the Aluminum Company of America. To change a cylinder of aluminum into a 110-foot-long section for an airplane wing, that's the kind of industrial magic Alcoa and only Alcoa is able to accomplish with this giant new 14,000-ton extrusion press at Lafayette, Indiana, leased to Alcoa by the United States Air Force. It's the largest extrusion press in the world. To make one of these giant extruded shapes, in this case an airplane wing spar over 50 feet long, a cylinder of Alcoa aluminum is first heated in a special electric oven and then placed in the new press. The ram is brought up to the cylinder and tremendous pressure is exerted, pressure equal to the weight of one of the Navy's heavy cruisers. Inside the press, the aluminum is shaped by squeezing it through a die. It's like squeezing toothpaste from a tube. After the extrusion has been heat treated for extra strength, it is then pulled into perfect shape on Alcoa's new stretcher, the world's most powerful, with its pulling force of three million pounds. Now, Alcoa is able to make one large airplane part take the place of several smaller parts. For the aircraft manufacturer, these extruded shapes are longer, stronger, save precious weight. They also mean lower cost and faster assembly. But this giant new press can work industrial magic for many other types of manufacturers. It can produce light but strong extruded shapes for the building of ships, for fast rolling trucks and trailers, for streamlined railroad cars. All of the extruded shapes, larger than ever before, thinner yet stronger than ever before. The new 14,000-ton extrusion press is one more example of how Alcor, since 1888, has continued to meet its responsibilities as the nation's first and leading producer of a vital metal. Aluminum by Alcor. Aluminum Company of America. There is no such thing as a typical southern town. We selected Nagatash and Gastonia because they reflect communities in two distinct parts of the South. We start with Dave Gillespie of the Gaston Citizen. Our greatest need at the moment is level-headedness. Whites of the South should not panic. Negroes should not whet their impatience. It is impossible for the South to turn back the clock and undo the injustice that was done to the Negro when he was brought into slavery. 
We cannot wish him away. We cannot close our eyes to his presence. The matter of educating the Negro is only one facet of the question, but the manner in which we handle it under the principles of the Constitution will set the pace for the solution of other phases of the so-called Negro problem. In a day when many nations and races are looking to us for leadership, to peace, and to freedom, we need to reflect in our own country the traditional American virtues of justice and fair play. All parts of this country, not only the South, should do some real soul searching in this respect. Next, Kay Dixon, who runs the Gastonia Bank of Commerce. Frankly, I'm troubled. I had uh, hoped for a decision of the Supreme Court that would be something in the nature of a straddle. I was uh, opposed to Earl Warren being put on the Supreme Court uh, for several reasons. I thought that he did not have uh, sufficient uh, judicial experience, and I was satisfied that he would not be sympathetic with the Southern viewpoint. Now, while this decision was unanimous, Yet the uh, Chief Justice uh, masterminded it and uh, rendered the decision. North Carolina, in my opinion, has uh, the very best of, social, of race relations of any southern state. And I would hate to see that disturbed. The thought in my mind is that uh, a proper solution, the correct, and best solution would be arrived at not by revolution but by evolution. Gastonia has a white high school and one for Negroes. This one is for whites. We have uh, been seeing in our uh, newspapers an era comes to an end. Uh, our court has said that the doctrine of uh, equal but separate uh, public school education has no place. What do you uh, think about uh, this decision, Jane? Well, our parents are more against non-segregation than we are, but the young people are actually the ones that have to live with them, and we may as well adapt ourselves to it now. Well, I don't feel exactly that way about it. I think people in Gastonia during the past years have gotten away from this purely segregation business because right now on our city council we have a colored man on our city council here in Gastonia and uh, but I don't think that I think maybe I'm like most people down here uh, we don't react to the things being forced down our throats like this it's entirely a different thing see than other than working it out yourself well I feel as a majority of the southerners do that this decision is like a cloud coming over our southland. But uh, I think in time our uh, colored citizens and white citizens can work out this problem, and um, I think it will strengthen America in the end. When I learned of the Supreme Court decision, I was disappointed because I'm a southerner. I was taught to be respectful of the Negroes as they were in my home and I had a maid to bring me up. But I was not taught to socialize with them. I think if we, uh, since the Supreme Court has given this decision, they will gradually go into our homes, our circles, and our church. And if this has to be done since the Supreme Court has given this, we are going to have to do it slowly because it is such a different way of living and it's going to affect everything that we do. Well, Miss Underwood, being a native Georgian, I'm very much against non-segregation. I feel that the Negroes certainly, uh, certainly deserve equal rights in, as far as education and schools are concerned. But I'm against the Negroes and the whites going to school together. I think that um, we as white people have developed an air of superiority over their race. And I think it would cause for a split in both races if they mixed and mingled because some of them couldn't come up to meet our standards. Well, my opinion on this issue would probably be different from the others here because I have had experience in going to school with the colored in New Jersey. And I have lived up north, uh, well, a lot of my life. And I think that if the people down here could see just how well the 
Kurt and White get along in the school in the north, and if they could adapt themselves down here like they are there, I don't think there would be any trouble, but it would take a while for the people down here to adapt themselves because we aren't used to anything like that. We still have many people in the South who have the opinion of separate but equal rights, separate but equal privileges. I think that probably that opinion is out of date. By that I mean that during the earlier history of our nation, we had aristocracy, we had a definite line of demarcation as far as the races were concerned. I think the Southerners have progressed to the extent now that we can approach this decision and this question as open-minded individuals, and I think we must do it that way, or else we will never solve the problem. That old opinion, that old school of thought is out of date. This is Highland High School on North York Road. History tells us that we have much to remember if we were to study American history. There are a number of events that the American people can never forget. To mention a few, the discovery of America, 1492. The Dred Scott decision as handed down by the Supreme Court and the proclamation of emancipation. And perhaps during your time, the development of the atomic bomb. On Monday, May the 17th, Chief Justice Warren read the decision of the Supreme Court justices, which ruled out segregation. I am pleased personally uh, at the vote that was handed down, a nine to nothing vote. It proved that the American people are thinking, that our statesmen are truly living up to expectations, that they are basing their opinion on our religious belief, basing their opinion on democratic living. Suppose now we hear what ideas you have on the Supreme Court decision. I like the Supreme Court ruling on a segregation because I think that we as Negroes can get a broader education and can uh, advance farther than we have in the past. And one other important reason is as the communists cannot use this as propaganda against the democratic form of government. Uh, the segregation laws were created at a time right after the Civil War when there was an intense feeling against the Negro, when the whites had only thought of the Negroes as working in their house and so forth. And you must realize that it must have been sort of hard for them to uh, get used to someone being accepted as their equal after working for them and something as though a cat or a household animal or something that you expect to see but there is no great love for. And these laws are uh, old and they were created by people who had nothing to do with this modern civilization of ours and they are altogether outdated. Um, I'm pleased with the issue that segregation has in it. But for myself, I would not like to attend the schools with the white children because of the fact that we aren't welcome. And I think that the consequence will be a mixture of Negroes and whites, but the consequence will also be an embarrassing situation for the Negro. Three days after the Supreme Court decision, the Parent Teachers Association met at a white elementary school. And I'd like to know what some of the rest of you think, and I'd like to hear some opinions from some of the rest of you. I'm a classroom teacher here in the school. Personally, as a teacher, I wouldn't mind teaching both colored and white children because I don't think that there'd really be any problem. I think where the real problem would be would be in the home because that's where you, where you learn your prejudices at home and you've got to uh, educate these parents. Thank you. This problem is not something new. We've seen it work itself out in the armed services here in the South. We've seen it work itself out in the postal services. We've seen it work itself out in the police forces of our communities or through the South. We go into the stores with colored people. We try on the clothes that they try on and we buy them that they have already tried on and uh, they seem to fit us and we seem to like it. I believe with all of my heart that this problem will be worked out. I hope that it will not, that it will be worked out gradually. I hope that they can enter the first grade and work from there on up, and then it will work itself out so gradually that we will not be conscious of the fact that we've had a problem. And I believe the South will come forward 
with a progressive move and that this section of the South will not be radical enough to do foolish like maybe some other sections of the South will do. As for me, the Negro PTA was something that I had looked forward to with anticipation because had the Supreme Court ruled otherwise, it would have, to my mind, been somewhat of a letdown or would the United States would have lost face in the world because of the problem of segregation. As of now, we will have some views from Mrs. Hope. Madam Chairman, in my opinion, we don't want, we don't want to be in the home and sleeping and doing with the white people. We want to free, we want to live free and feel free. We want schools like they have. We want streets like they have. We want homes like they have. We just want the same wedges and we work like they do. We want wedges like they do. We don't want to be in their homes and in their schools. We want schools of our own. We are people, just people. And we have children, and we want our children brought up just like the white people brought up, but we want them to be just them. We want them to be ourselves. We don't want like a heap of them think we want. We want freedom in every way and everywhere. We want to feel free. I just burns within me sometimes when I see the conditions of our children and our homes, and that caused so much crime. That's why the crimes come in, back alleys and back streets, over the fence. When they clean up that and put us on the map like the white, we'll feel free, and that's as far as we want to go. We just want our equal rights, his due us. All right, thank you, Mrs. Hope. Nakatash, Louisiana is 73 miles from Shreveport, 58 miles to Alexandria. As with Gastonia, no Supreme Court action since the Dred Scott decision hit it with such impact. This is Cunningham of the Nakatash Times. We believe that the Supreme Court decision ignores the fact that for good or ill, the white South pays almost all the taxes that go to the school system and that he who controls the pace had better be considered in making plans. It is this factor that makes us decide that Monday's decision may well turn out to be a disaster for the Negro. Nagatosh has one college, for whites only. There is a high school for each race. The Negro has made tremendous advances in this state and in the South in the past 15 years, and that leads me to say that segregation for both races is best. Segregation has and is working in the South, which contains two-thirds of the Negro population. The population of the Negro people in the United States is 15 million. The population of the Negro people in the South is 10 million. In Minnesota, with 14,022 Negroes, or one out of every 200, it certainly wouldn't be the same situation as compared with Mississippi with a population of 90 out of every 200. I'm now going to throw this discussion open to you and receive your questions and comments. Even though the Supreme Court has passed a ruling that segregation should be abandoned, that's no sign it will be. I believe that the Negroes will still go to their school and we'll go to our school unless they have some system of zoning, and that wouldn't work in Natchitoches because the, the whites and the colors are, live too close to one another. You just couldn't zone it off any way. There'd be uh, whites going to colored school and colors going to white school, just a few, and those few would be very unhappy. Uh, I personally do not believe that the Negro of the South wants to go to school with the uh, white people. Therefore, if the law is passed and uh, uh, segregation is done away with, and we do go to school with them, I believe that uh, such things as race riots and, and other things will come about because I do not believe the South is ready for segregation. 
non-segregation, excuse me. And you have to consider the fact that uh, there are an awful lot of colored teachers in the state, in our state of Louisiana. And if we did away with segregation right now and say had the two races intermingling in school next year, well, there would be an awful lot of colored teachers out of jobs because, uh, well, it, it would just be that way. I mean, mostly if a colored teacher and a white teacher would both apply at the same place, well, most probably the white teacher would get the job. A decision of the Supreme Court has been made that segregation has no place in public schools. We were asking you today to come prepared to discuss some of the problems that might face you as a result of this decision. What difference might this make in your lives as craftsmen, as workers? How do you feel that this Supreme Court decision will work out in education? In my opinion, Ms. Martin, I think that the decision handed down by the Supreme Court is one of the most wonderful things that happened in America and especially in the South in the last 50 years, and it will affect me greatly. Speaking of myself only, not being financially able to go to a distant college and spending money, I figure if this law is put into action that I'll be able to attend one college right here in my hometown of Natchitoches, and that college is Northwestern State College to obtain an education. I think that if the white and the colored students mingle, I don't think that there, there will be any conflicts between them. And uh, because I've lived with white people before, I am a veteran and I slept with them, I ate with them, and we got along fine. We were just friends. And I became friendly with some of them before I became friendly with my own race. And I think it's the wonderfulest thing that ever happened to America. Hey, Ms. Martin, I would like to add to what Sal said about in the classroom. I don't know exactly how I would feel in the classroom with the other white boys thing because we've been segregated all the time. But I would like to experience this because all men are created equal. And I think that if we would go to school with the white boys and have equal facility over there with them, we would be better still because we don't know if I'm better than they are or they are better than I am. But I would like to experience, see what would happen if I would go with them. All right. On Saturday evening, there was a meeting of citizens at the courthouse. By custom, the whites and Negroes sat on different sides of the aisle. Not very well have handed down any other decision. For had it done so, it would have said to the world that we are afraid to really risk democracy. I went to at least eight different schools in Pennsylvania and in Detroit, Michigan. And in all of my years in the elementary schools and in the high schools, I did not meet one Negro teacher during all of those years under a non-segregated system. Professor Williams. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mecker. Are there as many Negroes in the North as in the South? In certain areas, in certain areas there are, and I believe in proportion to population, you don't have as many colored teachers in the non-segregated areas of the North that you have in the South. If I'm going to a state-approved school, coming out with a certificate approved by the state of Louisiana and recognized by the nation, and I'm only qualified to teach my children or colored children, I have no business in a classroom at all. If my education or my training doesn't, plan, doesn't enable me to fix as good a pipe as a plumber, as there can be found anywhere. If my training as a shoemaker does not train me to fix as good a shoes as can be found any place. If my training to use the surgeon's knife, if you will, does not train me to cut on one human being who has the same anatomy as another, I dare say my training has been at fault. I have no business in a classroom at all. I don't think the decision of the Supreme Court is right. I think it's taking away states' rights, 
And I believe our country was founded on the principle of a democracy for the people and by the people. And I believe that you people, our colored people, will agree that Louisiana has done all they could to give equal opportunities to all people, regardless of color, race, or creed. And we should give everybody equal opportunity. But I've been living around the colored people all my life, and I don't believe they want to go to our white schools. They want to have their own schools and their own things so they'll feel like they belong to them and not mix in with the whites. On the seventh day, after the Supreme Court decision, the people of Nagatash went to church. As citizens of the United States, let us not be too hasty, but let us remember to think and plan with the spirit of Christ. Some of the good people of both races who live under the protection of the United States may not be satisfied with the decision of the Supreme Court, but all of us know that the Supreme Court of the United States is the highest governing power that we have in the world. Paul tells us, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Amen. Gastonia, North Carolina, on the seventh day, the people went to church. My own heritage is rooted in the South. My father, born in 1847 in South Carolina, owned slaves for a few years. He lived through the hard days of Reconstruction and under the carpet bagger, and yet he came to adjust himself to these new economic conditions and to change the race relations. And I suppose the last area of my own life to come under the influence and dominance of Jesus Christ was in my own attitude towards the Negro. And so now for several years I have held the conviction and I still hold it, that the practice of segregation cannot be defended on the basis of the Christian religion. And now that the highest judicial body in this republic of ours, consisting of nine men appointed by three different presidents of the United States, has given this unanimous decision I feel it to be my conscientious duty to do my best to implement this action helpfully, patiently, lovingly, and realistically. We have tried to hold a mirror behind two southern cities as they debate and discuss seriously and soberly a new aspect of an old problem. There will be no closing commercial tonight. But it is a privilege to tell you that See It Now is presented and made possible by Alcoa, the Aluminum Company of America. If tonight's CBS reports has a point of view, it is that no one man can speak for the South, for Southerners like other Americans speak with many voices. This is the state capital at Atlanta, Georgia. And during the next hour, you will hear the many voices of Georgians discussing racial segregation in their public schools. Some of the voices are ominous. I had rather interrupt my kids' education for a while than to have him mix and mangle 
and that's what they seem to want. But you don't want that. No, uh, we want we want segregated schools at any cost. And when I say any cost, I mean any cost, cost of life if necessary. Thank you very much. Some of the voices are gentle. My individual responsibility as a Christian citizen insists that I speak out for open schools for all children because uh, of my own, that's the way my heart speaks, and my own love for children and because I am a mother and a grandmother. Some of the voices are tense. Might express an opinion as to whether or not you thought that uh, separate schools would equal schools are better for your race or integrated schools. If they was equal, the plan would be all right. You'd be satisfied with them if they're equal. If they was equal. But they're not equal here. No, sir. Six years ago this month, the Supreme Court declared the compulsory segregation of public schools illegal. Tonight's report is an effort to concentrate on that ruling as it affects Georgia and the Georgians. This is no effort to mirror all the problems that confront the South. We are not dealing here with sit-downs at the lunch counter, and we are not dealing with segregation on the beaches or on the playgrounds. Rather, it is our hope that this report may do something to answer that vital question, who speaks for the South? First, we hear from Ralph McGill, Pulitzer Prize-winning editor who has just been named a publisher of the Atlanta Constitution. Well, sir, you have been a student of this problem long before the Supreme Court made its decision. What do you think could have been done differently that might have produced more progress and less friction? Mr. Murray, I think the basic tragedy was at the outset in 1954 that this whole thing was not put into the hands of people in education. They could have brought in the social workers, they could have brought in sociologists, they could have brought all of these things into play, but chiefly into the hands of the educators. Uh, this was not done. The Supreme Court spoke of children. This is about children. But what happened? It fell into the hands of politicians, lawyers, and courts. Now, most of the school plans that have been produced have been produced by lawyers, not educators. Four years after the Supreme Court decision, neither the educators nor the politicians had solved the problem. In 1958, Negroes brought suit against the Atlanta Board of Education to bring about integration of the public schools. They won their suit, and U.S. District Judge Hooper approved the school board's desegregation plan in December 1959. But the plan ran head-on into state laws designed to close any integrated schools. The 1960 legislature refused to change these laws, but it did appoint a school study committee headed by John A. Sibley. The school study committee asked the residents of Georgia's 10 congressional districts which of two options they preferred. Option one, continue segregated public schools in accordance with state regulations. Even if this leads to their closing and the substitution of a system of private education. Or option two, permit local communities to decide their own school policy free from state control, even if this leads to integration. Option one, continued segregation. Option two, the possibility of integration. One of the hearings was held in Moultrie, seat of Colquitt County in southwest Georgia. It is a rural community with strong memories of the Confederacy and separate facilities for whites and Negroes. The school study committee, headed by John A. Sibley, an Atlanta banker, conducted its public hearing in Moultrie's high school gymnasium. More than 1,000 spectators heard witnesses from 14 counties. Negroes comprise about 40% of the population of this region. I'm speaking as a taxpayer of the city of, of the state of Georgia and the father of a school-aged child. One child? One child. And rather than see the children of the white people of Georgia surrendered to the Supreme Court and Atlanta newspapers, I would prefer abolishing public education forever and eternally. Well, let me ask you one question. Which, uh, which, which of you uh, would prefer most not to surrender, the Supreme Court or the Supreme Court of the Atlanta newspaper? I think they're one and the same. All right. <laughs> I'm 
I'm Robert Kerbo, and I represent the American Legion Post Number 175 at Hopeful, Mitchell County. How many members, Mr. Kerbo? 36. Have you taken a vote on this question? Yes, sir. And what is your, what, what's the position of your uh, organization? I'm authorized to say that our post is wholeheartedly for segregated schools, even if it means going to private schools. And furthermore, it's this time we see no need to change our state school laws. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been authorized by the Board of Trustees of Lakeview Chapel to offer the facilities of Lakeview Chapel to the white citizens of Colquitt County for educational purposes for their children, for the operation of a private school, if necessary, and with our help and the help of an almighty God. Thank you. I'm Harriet E. Southwell, a housewife and a citizen, an ex-teacher. My view is that as far as I'm concerned, nothing will be accomplished by closing the schools of Georgia. Conditions would only be worsened. It would be simply an evasion of an issue which has to be faced humbly, prayerfully, with the help of God. I would like for the people to at least be able to vote on it. Thank you very much. With the conviction that our democratic system of public education constitutes one of the bulwarks of our nation, we, the members of the Ministerial Association of Albany, recommend that those in positions of leadership in our state do all within their power to continue to maintain public schools for all. We feel that the closing of our public school system would pose problems which would greatly hinder the progress of the state of Georgia has so magnificently made in recent years. It is our opinion that the end of the public school system would be tragic, not only for the children, but for every citizen of the state. Mr. Reverend J.B. Carston, Albany, Georgia, pastor of the Raleigh White Baptist Church. I disagree with the report our president read because it will give the state the privilege of integrating our schools if they desire to do so. I represent 400 members of Albany, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 uh, children. I'm their pastor, been there five years. We just released a man the other day from our congregation for teaching integration. And we're standing full, flat-footed for plan number one. Thank you very much. I don't hate you call you white, but God fixed a distance between us that we can work together, walk together, and talk together. Then I know where I live at night, you know where you live, and I can go there and rest. And you can go to your place and rest. And I feel that it's so much freer the way it is now for me to educate 19 children. And I say, if it takes closing to the schools, if there's no other way, close the school to keep me black and keep you white, by the help of God, let the doors be closed. <laughs> I'd like to say this. I'm on the table just a few minutes. Well, it's going to be short and sweet. Let not give you that long. But this number two, it appears to me, is nothing but a dressed up token integration deal. What is your... and, and I'd like to say this, that the, I was born here in the South. I, ha, I, I was, I'm not migrated or sent down here from anywhere. And the people of the state of Georgia that stand up here and say, number two, number two, all I ask is, is that they pray about it, good people, pray about it. What do you say? And I say this. I mean, what number do you say? I say for integration at all costs. No, you mean segregation. I mean segregation, excuse me. <laughs> well, we'll let you go. I think segregation. Thank you very much. Long live Herman Talmadge and Roy Hill and take into, into consideration what my friends in other sections tell me of schools that have been forced to integrate, then the situation is so intolerable. They tell me that most people who can afford it are sending their children to private schools. Therefore, I vote for option, uh, not option, I mean the number one. Choice number one. Choice number one. I have already 
appeared before this committee where representing was, myself. Where was that? That was at Douglas. Well, don't you live in this community? No, now? I don't. I was uh, asked to come here today to represent the U.S. clans, not to the Ku Klux Klan of Colquitt County. And I believe I asked, uh, on, I've asked all the witnesses, the number of people they represented. My recollection is that when I asked a member of your clan that they said that was a secret, they didn't tell that. Well, that they haven't even told me that. So you don't know how many you represent? No, I don't. We're glad to hear from you. I'd like to read this to you. There's a sibling school committee in Moultrie, Georgia. We, the U.S. clan, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan of Moultrie, Colquitt County, Georgia, vote 100% for segregation of schools and will help support private schools statewide. If private school is what it takes to keep the races pure, both black and white. All right. Thank you very much. And in my county, we have enrolled in our county schools approximately 500 more Negroes than we do whites. And uh, I think our Negroes are happy in their school situation. And if left alone without any outside interference, we would never have any integration trouble. Uh, as a citizen, I am unalterably opposed to integration in any form. Anywhere. Always, now and forevermore. And anywhere. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very and much. And I'm in favor of closing the schools, if necessary, to preserve our system and Southern traditions. Thank That's you very much. Well, let's keep the schools open. I think that there must be some solution to this problem. We have lived here in the South in peace for years and years. And there must be a solution. Do not close our schools. I, I mean, I went to the school before, the, before, we could, before we had the free books. Mr. Sibley, God, for God's sake, let us keep our schools open, please. They gotta, there's, there's a solution. Well, now, would you mind expressing an opinion? And if you don't want to, don't do it with equal school for the whites and colors but separately, would you prefer that than to integrate the school between whites and colored? Which would be your Well, uh, Mr. Sibley, I am a student of the doctrine of separate but equal. But now, separate but equal. see, in the past, looked like all the emphasis was placed on separate, but wasn't too much emphasis placed on equal, see? Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> well you you and I both will have to agree that wasn't right. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, you. You should know by now that you cannot have segregated public schools much longer. It's now, it's against the law. As soon as any Negro challenges the right, the right of your school to, to remain segregated, it will have to be integrated or closed. You should. You have number two. You, yes, you I am. Well, I, I believe Just, just a moment, I'd like to say some more. All right. You should also know that these, pop, these politicians who tell you that you can have private schools for your children have no plan. They say, private school's fine. Everything's going to work out all right. right. But they have no plan. And you yeah. should also know that most of you cannot afford private schools. You yeah. don't have yeah, the money. We're not, we're not committing arguments that we can help it. Now, you make it no, no, no. Just let me say something. <laughs> 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 and most, and the reason that most of you who want segregation want to keep it is that you're afraid of intermarriage. But there's no strong attraction between the races. I don't know why you think there's going to be so much intermarriage if there's integration. It's, it's foolish to try to keep segregation. Well, now, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, the next witness. Eugene Talmadge, four times elected governor of Georgia dominated its politics for 20 years. He and his successors drew much of their strength from the rural areas of Georgia under the system of county unit voting. There are varying opinions about this system. Ralph McGill. This is a very frustrating thing that uh, keeps us in political bondage. Uh, in this state, because of the unit system, it is possible to obtain the most votes and still lose an election. This has happened. This isn't a theory. This has happened. Is it true, Mr. McGill, that in Chattahoochee County, one vote there counts for as much as 155 votes here in Atlanta? As I recall, the last election figures from Chattahoochee County 
and say my vote here in Fulton County was worth one 177th of one of the votes in Chattahoochee County. It would take roughly 177 votes here to make one of theirs. Governor Vandiver. The county unit system of nominations assures a diffusion of political initiative over the entire state and gives all of our people a choice in the conduct of state affairs. It prevents a single area of concentrated population from imposing its will to the absolute exclusion of all other areas of the state. It eliminates the possibility of a Tammany Hall. It eliminates the possibility of a Pendergast machine. It eliminates the possibility of machines such as the old Boss Crump machine. It eliminates the possibility of the wholesale evils in which they indulged. The county unit system is in the best tradition of representative government. And it was representative government upon which this country was founded and to which it owes all of its greatness. Most of the opposition to the county unit system comes from the biggest city, Atlanta. During the war between the states, it was a city of 10,000. Today, Atlanta, population one million, is the economic and cultural capital of the southeast United States. This is Insurance Row on Pete Street. More than 3,000 national companies have Atlanta branches and vast manufacturing plants. And it is the home of Georgia Tech, and Atlanta University. Atlantans are proud of their public school system, which enrolls 115,000 youngsters, a system which might be closed as a result of the segregation controversy. The Sibley School Committee hearing in Atlanta generated great excitement, and spectators filled the Henry Grady Gymnasium long before it got underway. I'm Mrs. Thomas M. Breeden, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Statewide Organization of Hope Incorporated. No. I am speaking for approximately 15,000 people in this con congressional district. Hope's policy is now and has been from the beginning to champion the rights of all children to a free public education. We do not feel that even the temporary closing of one school in defiance of the federal law can in any way be justified. However, recognizing the wide divergence of opinion which has been very well pointed out by these hearings, we feel that perhaps the first step toward a solution which can be accepted by the majority of the people is the adoption of a local option policy by the state. We further feel that an informed public discussing this crisis among themselves and with their elected representatives can avert the awesome calamity of empty classrooms. Thank you very much. My name is Thomas J. Wesley, Jr. I'm a real estate man. I've lived in Atlanta all my life. My organization has over 5,000 members in Fulton County. Now, what's the name of your organization? The name of the organization is the Metropolitan Association to Continue Segregated Education. Is that the sole purpose of the organization? That's the sole purpose education? of the organization. Some of the people are saying, save our schools. We say, save our children first. The reasons for separation of the races are very important in the South. We want the Negroes to have full opportunity for self-advancement, but see no reason why this necessarily entails their forced inclusion into places where they are not suited. When we can no longer operate our public schools, which we erected with our money and maintain and operate with our money, then we should close them, dispose of the buildings, and educate our children by other means. Local communities at the town, county, or neighborhood level can purchase at public auction the school buildings which are no longer required by an abandoned public educational system. In other words, a closed public school is just a piece of surplus public real estate. Most of us who are mothers and fathers are not concerned with the political aspects of this thing. Our main concern is the moral development of our young men and women, our sons and daughters. 
should they be forced to mix and mingle with a class of people who in general have shown a definitely lower standard of culture, health, and moral character. I, I have some statistics. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't, I don't think we care for that. We've got your views. And if we get into a debate uh, with one... I think we've got a little organized applause. Our nation had the May 17, 1954 Supreme Court decision translated into 42 languages and sent it around the world. The United States wanted the struggling darker peoples to realize our sense of justice. As we publish our good things, Russia propagandizes our mistakes. Number two, we need more and better education for all. Democracy requires a higher level of intelligence than any other form of government as the power is with the body politic. Less than 100 Negro students would be involved in Atlanta, thereabout. Where they live will determine where they attend school. We have the brains, the character, the goodwill, the religion, and the democratic desire to solve to the advantage of all the problem which is before us. We must give every child more and better education. Thank you very much. How long, sir? Will we white people of the South continue to be discounted and disfranchised before the rest of our country and the world because we insist on perpetuating a master-servant society that enslaves a so-called master as well as a so-called servant? How long can we continue as Christians to be enthusiastic about Christian missions in Asia and Africa and in our home society so little as to neutralize the effect of our missionaries in these and other lands. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. I'm representing about 120 parents, teachers, and students. Did you, have a, did you have a poll? We did not have a poll, but being a Christian school, we take the position of the Bible on all matters. Which position do you take on this matter? The right. position is number one. Number one. And right. I have a brief statement. That we believe that segregation is scriptural, reading directly from the Bible. Uh, give us a reference if you don't mind. Acts 17, 26. I'll go ahead. That God determined the bounds of the habitations. Go ahead. We believe that segregation is constitutional, that Congress, the only body empowered by the uh, Constitution to make uh, laws has not passed a desegregation law. All right. We feel that segregation is educationally sound, that it meets both races on their own level in homogeneous groups and best serves the purposes of both races. And we feel that integration uh, is subversive in that it divides the people, it uh, go, uh, leads toward the uh, communist goal of amalgamation of the races, it uh, promotes centralization of power, and uses the Negro to um, set up a police state with the federal government policing the situation. Thank you very much. As a native-born Georgia citizen, I desire to make the following statement. I believe I reflect the thinking and opinions of the three following units over which I have the pleasure to preside at the present time. One, my family, a wife to whom I've been married for the past 53 years. We've raised and educated six children who in turn are educating 18 grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. Hope you'll pardon my pride if I say one of them is Matty Wilder Dobbs, a member of the Metropolitan Opera Company in New York City. One of the great singers in the country. It's the world. <laughs> the Georgia Voters League, of which I am the organizer and the president for the past 20 years, this organization has been very instrumental in helping to register 175,000 Negro voters in Georgia. I believe the wish and the desire of the majority of these Negro citizens of Georgia is that our public schools shall never be closed under any circumstances whatsoever, and that the facilities of these public schools shall be made available to the children of all the people without regard to race or creed on a non-segregated basis in keeping with the laws and decisions of the United States Supreme Court, which has for its motto on the outside engraved in marble in that building in Washington, equal justice under law.
With thanks to the committee, I am John Wesley Dodd. Thank you. And uh, what's your business? I'm a plumber. <laughs> you the gentleman that called me up uh, one night said... Yes, sir, I did. I asked you uh, about how to get on this uh, committee. I'd like uh, to uh, express my views. And uh, I told you how to do it. Yes, sir, you sure did. I thank you. All right. Now, uh, you've heard these options, have you? Number one and number yes, two? Yes, Which one do you prefer? I'm not sure about the number, but I'll tell you right now, Mr. Sibling. Well, uh, uh, I'd rather die fighting this uh, godless, communistic integration than to live under it. And, uh... You would be option number one, then. And, uh, just one short thing. And all the rantings of the Atlanta newspapers, the, these few so-called integrationist preachers, the do-gooders, and uh, communist sympathizers can't change my mind. I'm not going to mix. These white people have thrown up their hands and hollered, oh, Lord, we're whipped. Don't shoot. I think they ought to go crawl in a hole and quit. I am representing Bishop J.W.E. Bowen, my husband, one of Atlanta's oldest citizens. We represent 27,000 members of the Methodist Church in Georgia. We believe Atlanta could start integration in the public schools without incident. We believe the city of Atlanta and Fulton County have a sufficient number of Negro people who are law-abiding and intelligent enough to work harmoniously with the leaders of the white group to bring about integration, has, as has been shown in the case of the golf links and the railroad stations and the city transportation buses, the public library, and the airport dining room. We believe that this city could start integration without incident and trouble. Thank you. Did you leave your paper with us? I have given you paper. Now, my boy went to uh, the uh, kindergarten and first grade in Providence, Rhode Island. This little girl, Negro girl, followed him around like a puppy dog. We don't want that in the South. We don't want to have those questions. Thing. We don't want that. You'll have to, uh, we'll, we've got your now, position and got your wife's now, letter. Wait a minute. Like you know you let I, other people have their say? Not if I could help you. <laughs> well, they I, did. Uh, I've let... Uh, I've but, let, I've let uh, Wherever there was a person that represented a uh, group... Well, I represent something. myself on that. Well, I, I've heard your position, and we've got your wife, and I thank you very much. Well, I would still like to read that uh, little we'll, excerpt from that letter, we'll, please. We'll, we'll read your letter. I, like, spent, I like, spent 20 years of my life to protect this country. May I read that uh, excerpt? Let the people know that the people up north are not nigger lovers. Well, I see that I'm not afforded the same right as some of the niggas that's been on there. Well, well, Reverend Harry, we didn't mean that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish to say that the niggers are, are our own people. They are eighth and tenth generation Southerners, fellow human beings and fellow Americans. They manifest the traditional Southern virtues of honor in dealing with an adversary, courage in adversity, and they are now practicing the traditional American virtue of taking responsibility for oneself by seeking to secure their rights as human beings. We, a small section of the world, cannot halt mankind's progress without the inevitable consequence of decline, spiritually and materially. I am in favor of free, non-segregated schools for all our children, black and white, who are born equal in every respect, except in the lack of opportunity that we whites, to our shame, inflict upon them, the colored ones. In Atlanta, the sizable majority was for local option. Atlanta's mayor, now serving his sixth term, is William B. Hartsfield. He discusses the public school crisis with Arthur Morse of CBS. Uh, Mr. Hartsfield, what do you think the effect of closed public schools would be on the city of Atlanta? The result would be 
cataclysmic. It would destroy the city if it kept up. There would be a migration away of the young, intelligent people who wanted to pursue education. There would be a immediate consternation among particularly those of graduating age, who those families that wanted their children to be doctors and lawyers and professional people would have to leave in order to ensure their children's education. It would be hard to bring skilled people into the state. They would not come here knowing in advance they had no facilities for their children. And then uh, those who advocate the private school forget the plight of the poor man who has no money to educate his children. The financial, the economic results aside from the educational results would be tragic. Mr. Hartsfield, in, in your more than 20 years as mayor, have you observed any substantial changes in public attitudes about race relations? Yes. I am one who thinks that a great deal of this question of school closing, uh, race relations, is that we are not hearing from the right people. The old-fashioned crowd is still in charge of the mechanics of politics, both in Georgia and the South. And I think that out of all of this is coming a, a, a sort of political revolution that is going to follow the Industrial Revolution. I have many times said, and I repeat, that there's nothing about this whole problem that 15 years will not cure when the younger element comes in. If you will attend uh, a meeting in behalf of the old order, it's always old people trying to live in the past. You attend a meeting on the other side and they're young people thinking about the future. Uh, recently, Atlanta's Negro uh, college students placed full page advertisements in the local newspapers in which they alleged various injustices and in an advertisement titled An Appeal for Human Rights. In response to this, Governor Vandiver stated, and I quote in part, the statement was skillfully prepared. Obviously, it was not written by students. Regrettably, it had the same overtones which are usually found in anti-American propaganda pieces. It did not sound like it was prepared in any Georgia school or college, nor in fact did it read like it was written even in this country. Now, that was Governor Vandiver's response. What was your reaction to the ad? We have six great Negro universities here, and uh, they are supposed to be educating someone. And uh, I thought that uh, the ad was, in fact, I know that ad was composed on the campuses of these universities. And I agree that it was skillfully prepared. And uh, it uh, probably came as a shock to some people to know that there were that kind of folks around who could do that sort of thing. I stated publicly that I could not find fault with any human being in this world uh, who gives voice to his hopes, his aims, and his aspirations. And I think it has been in the good American tradition that anyone in this country feeling aggrieved has a right to speak out. And I thought it was a good way to go about it, much better than uh, irresponsibly creating trouble or waving banners or carrying signs or starting uh, uh, riots or incidents. You know, the great trouble with this uh, great many Southern white people, my friends, they only know the Negro who works for them. They think that all Negroes are servants because they hire one. Out in the country, they see the Negro chopping cotton and they think all Negroes are cotton choppers. They do not realize that the Negro has progressed exactly like the white man. I don't think you and I would want to be judged by some old shuffling can heat bum who came down the street because he was white and, that, and uh, have our whole uh, civilization uh, uh, judged by that standard. And that's a great mistake that we are making, judging another people, not by its good people, not even by its medium but by its lowest. That's wrong. Mayor Hartsfield, how can the school crisis be resolved? Well, it can be resolved if every courageous man and woman in the state of Georgia spoke out. The great trouble is that so many people keep silent. 
If you were to leave this thing to the parents of Georgia, they would register an overwhelming desire for the continuance of public education. You know, the great trouble in this battle is that there are a lot of people that never were in favor of public education to begin with. For them, we had to make laws to compel them to send their children to school. There are a few selfish people who, having no children, don't want to pay the taxes. Now, all of those people are exercising their influence on the final result. We are fortunate in Georgia in that we have the privilege of discussing these things in advance. Now, this thing hit Little Rock cold, and uh, they didn't have the court decisions that we now have. It hit Virginia with less preparation, and surely with the experience of Little Rock, the court decisions that came out of it, the experience in Virginia, and the court decisions that came out of that. I think there will be no excuse for Georgia not to act most intelligently in this matter of the preservation of a system of public education. Georgia and the Deep South cannot continue forever to live outside of and in defiance of national opinion and what is now worldwide opinion. The mayor and the governor differ about the consequences of integrating the Atlanta public schools. The governor. Well, if experience in other sections of the nation is any guide, it would lead one to believe that the consequences would be bad. Certainly, where integration is forced, a lot of difficulties ensue. I'll not go into them at the present time, for I'm sure that you're familiar with the blackboard jungle type of conditions which are prevalent in some of our larger cities. The mayor. I think that the thing can be worked out, and many of the things that the rabble-rousers have, uh, have uh, sought to, to confuse us with would not happen. Um, remember that we've got a cosmopolitan population here, and someone in our school department estimated that we have between five and 10,000 white children who have already been to school with Negroes in other sections of the country. Ed, it's the feeling of the overwhelming masses of the people of Georgia, both white and colored, that separate educational facilities in Georgia are best for both races. Who Speaks for the South will continue after this brief pause for station identification. Or Murrow. Atlanta's largest segregation group is the Metropolitan Association to Continue Segregated Education. At a recent rally, members were addressed by James H. Gray, a native of Massachusetts, now chairman of the Democratic Party in Georgia. Georgia. What you and I are up against in the South today in this situation is blackmail. It's blackmail pure and simple. <laughs> the hard truth is that education cannot effectively be mixed with largely hypocritical ideas about social reform. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the hard political fact that lurks behind all those crocodile tears that have been shed so sanctimoniously for civil rights on the Washington scene today. It is the Negro block vote. <laughs> in, in three such key states as New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois, the Negro vote can be decisive, not only in state affairs, but equally in national affairs. Jacob Javits of New York. <laughs> that self-styled liberal owes his senatorship to that block vote. Paul Douglas, another great liberal, self-styled, is the senator from Illinois, and I'll tell you why. When he ran for the Senate back in 1954, 60% of his plurality belonged to the Negro block vote. 
And by the way, please remember this definition of a Washington liberal. That's a, that's a politician who every time he looks over his shoulder, he sees a black shadow. <laughs> There's another related fact, too, and that is some of the best-known integrationists in our state of Georgia already have their children safely tucked away in private schools. <laughs> and for that matter, so do many of the leading integrationists on the Washington scene, and including Richard Milhouse Nixon, vice president of the NAACP. <laughs> It must be recognized that legislation which goes beyond assuring equality before the law and seeks to compel social integration is a monstrosity and it is doomed to failure. <laughs> Free-thinking Americans will never, never accept such regimentation or such an invasion of individual rights. I intend to stand for these beliefs and I intend to fight for their preservation. And I trust that, that you good people will do the same. This is Roy Harris, President of the Citizens' Councils of America. The Constitution of this state forbids segregated, uh, integrated schools and it, whether it be by pupil placement, parent choice, or token integration. And that Constitution can't be changed unless two things happen. And it can only be changed once every two years. And that's in the November election of 1960, and then again in 1962. It can only be changed by a vote of the people. But before the people can vote on it, the legislature must meet and submit a proposal to amend the Constitution. Now, here's my prediction. The legislature won't meet this year. So you're not going to be able to change, and I want you to take this word to Rastus if any of you see it. Rastus is the segregationist nickname for Ralph McGill of the Atlanta Constitution. The, the Constitution can't be changed until November 1962, if then. I want to make another prediction. When November comes, we're not going to vote for Nixon for president. We're going to vote for Kennedy for president. We're not going to vote for Humphrey for president. We're not going to vote for the renegade from Texas for president. We are going to elect 12 independent electors from Georgia. I want to say this to the candidates who may be running from, on the Democratic ticket and on the Republican ticket. The Lord help them if it's a close election and they need our votes. <laughs> Peter Zach Gear, Executive Secretary to Governor Vandemark, is a rising young politician that it is just as impossible to integrate the schools and classrooms of Georgia as it would be for that great Hawaii Walker, Mayor Willie B. Hartsfield. <laughs> to slide backwards up a 100-foot grease pole in the hot sun of Twiggs County, Georgia. I wish to you all success in your dedication to constitutional government, to that form of government which will never, no, it shall never yield to tyranny, to dictatorship, to federal force, and to 
the polyglot bureaucrats and social schemers who occupy transitory positions of power in Washington, D.C., and who no, not a one of them, could be elected to a public office by a vote of the people. I wish for you all Godspeed, and when I may be of service to you, do not hesitate to come by the governor's office, for to do service to your cause will be a high privilege to me. God bless you all. Other meetings also were taking place. This is a state convention of hope, whose initials stand for Help Our Public Education. Sylvan Meyer, editor of the Gainesville Times. The solution to conquering apathy, the solution to conquering silence, is to speak up. Last year at a Hope rally, I said that the change in Georgia was just a whisper, that it was almost Im imperceptible, but that it was definitely in the offing. And in that year, the sound of change has become a shout, and it's plain to anyone who will look that all the forces that add up to change in Georgia are at work constructively. Now, we've rarely in Georgia had to fear physical reprisal for speaking our minds. Those who spoke out faced in the main the unpleasantness of temporary unpopularity, the unpleasantness of being the nonconformist in a society, as we have heard, that places its emphasis on conformity. We faced, some of us, the more subtle recriminations of what was, after all, only a thin extremist fringe of the population in Georgia. Now, in the last few weeks, we've come into an entirely new situation in Georgia, I think. The issues are much clearer, and I believe it's time to define just what we are. There are some things that every American is weaned on, that he believes in, basically. One, the principle of local self-determination. Two, the dependence of the American way of life on the survival of the public school system. And three, three, equality under the law. And four, I shouldn't forget, freedom of speech. Let's remember and emphasize those all the time because, in my opinion, it is mind-changing mind time in Georgia. Thank you. Dominant in this controversy is the dynamic industrial and economic growth of the South. The face of Atlanta and much of the South is undergoing rapid and permanent change. Ralph McGill of the Atlanta Constitution is an acute observer of these developments. Mr. McGill, what is happening here in Georgia in addition to the school issue? Is it perhaps the breaking through of an industrial society through the old agricultural society? Yes, sir. But what is happening, sir? We're in the grip of not merely the coming of industry, but we're also in the process of an industrial revolution at the same time. We've had in this area, in the southeast, roughly three-fifths of the nation's farms. This meant they were small farms, many, many small farms. Now, these are no longer an economic unit, unit. And so they are pouring into our cities basically good people but they have little education they have no skills uh, they come in unequipped to take an industrial job uh, and so we have here a tremendous overloading of all of our school systems the welfare agencies uh, it's reflected in every aspect of our government now these people coming in unequipped they pretty soon feel insecure fearful they bring with them all of their old rural prejudices and folk ways and uh, they come together in a very insecure situation and so they fall pretty easy prey to all sorts of demagogic uh, assertions uh, they are troubled people and they need help this is one of the problems which isn't really being met. Uh, and this 
is at the background of the South, and it would be very unwise. And I'm delighted you mentioned this, because I have a, a fear that some of our friends in the other areas may fail to take into consideration that this revolution and this transition in agriculture and industry is the backdrop against which this school problem is being played. Uh, Mr. McGill, I have the feeling that in spite of the loud and raucous voices, that this debate has been conducted in a rather even-tempered fashion. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, much so than some of our less fortunate neighbors, perhaps. I think this is in part because those raucous voices have in large part been so preposterous and so ridiculous in some of their claims uh, and assertions so abusive that, that uh, they have rather discounted themselves and we rather hope they continue as raucous as they've been because they they help the climate well mr mcgill if uh, the public schools in atlanta should be integrated in september of 1961 will there be trouble there might be some sir and there probably and almost certainly will be agitation and and attempts at agitation but we have a very fine mayor a wonderful chief of police a fine staff of police which will do their duty and if uh, we can have some help from the sheriff's office and if the other neighboring uh, fanatic elements or extremist elements don't send in people from outside uh, we'll get along without any trouble i have confidence in our people to keep order i gather that in spite of the fact that you have been under a rather serious and sustained attack that your faith in the future of the south is undiminished is that right oh yes sir this is a great region with a great future great people and we'll make it thank you ralph mcgill thank you sir we return to governor vandiver for his views on judge hooper's recent ruling um on may 9th judge hooper ruled that the public schools in atlanta must be integrated by september of 1961 what is your reaction to that ruling governor well, I stated soon after Judge Hooper's action that the matter apparently addressed itself to the 1961 General Assembly. Certainly, I would not want to predict what a General Assembly that has not even been elected would eventually do. However, I do know that the problems which will confront them will be the most serious, the most faithful ever to face modern-day Georgia. I am confident that the people of this state will elect to their General Assembly men of character, men of patriotism, strong men who will be equal to the task and will give this situation open-minded consideration. Who speaks for the South? Who speaks for Georgia? Judge Hooper has ordered that integration shall occur by September of 1961. The Sibley Committee has reflected a deep and wide difference of opinion. The governor indicates that the solution must come from the legislature. The solid South is no longer solid. There is in progress here a great dialogue, a public debate in the tradition of our country. Now here's my prediction. The legislature won't meet this year. There are some things that every American is weaned on, that he believes in, basically. Let's remember and emphasize those all the time, because in my opinion, it is mind-changing mind time in Georgia. for the South was filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News.
I'm against the Negroes and the whites going to school together. I think that um, we as white people have developed an air of superiority over their race. And I think it would cause for a split in both races if they mixed and mingled because some of them couldn't come up to meet our standards. All men are created equal. And I think that if we would go to school with the white boys and have equal facility over there with them, we would be better students. 25 years ago, Edward R. Murrow got those reactions in a southern town to the unanimous Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, a decision which outlawed segregation in the public schools. That was 1954. I was 13 years old then, growing up in Philadelphia. Schools there and elsewhere in the North didn't practice segregation officially, but in those days before busing, schools in black neighborhoods were black. That didn't change for some years. On this anniversary of the Supreme Court decision, we decided to measure that change, north and south, not just in education, but in political and social life as well. I went back to Philadelphia, a city struggling with the same urban problems as many of its northern neighbors. A city which right now seems as divided as those southern towns which Ed Murrow visited. Philadelphia will be the subject of tomorrow night's broadcast. Right now, I'll be taking you somewhere else, somewhere I never could have gone 25 years ago as a reporter who was black, even if CBS had hired me, Mississippi. I'd been there only a few times, but I knew the state well by its reputation. All blacks did. It was one of the principal battlefields of the civil rights movement, a place where resistance to change was fiercest. When you thought of Mississippi, you thought of the Klan, of lynchings, shotguns in the night, police dogs, and fire hoses. I wasn't eager to visit Mississippi, but it too has changed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily bread, and give us our trespasses. But even here in Tupelo, I came face to face with an old racial nightmare. Do you think black people in this country should have the right to vote? Not really. Why? Uh, we believe in this country. It should be a white country. We feel that ultimately if the blacks are not repatriated back to Africa, that we'll be faced with the same situation that they're facing right now in Rhodesia and South Africa. Whenever they outbreed us and have more Negroes here than we have white people, they will not demand free elections. They will demand black rule. The irony of that conversation is obvious. 25 years ago, I could have been beaten or possibly killed instead of getting answers to my questions. So, the first of a two-part series, Mississippi, the good and the bad, as I saw it, 25 years after Brown versus the Board of Education. court's conclusion in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education was that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Twenty-five years later, the South has the most integrated school system of any region in the country. This is Tupelo High, integrated in 1970. The town is 18 percent black, and so is the student body. Number 31, Joe Washington Jr., integration has made a difference. Hey, don't say if you don't, go run into your pants again. If I ain't gone, go into depth. Despite integration in the locker room and on the court, the fans still choose to sit apart in the bleachers. 
Joe's father is assistant principal at Tupelo High in charge of building maintenance. Mrs. Washington teaches in a local junior high school. What's been the difference in Joe Washington Jr. being 17th in his class, being president of the student body, being a star basketball player? What's made it for him? Well, we as his parents have tried to give him the best we knew how by telling him to be positive in all his actions and not look for limitations or special favors of any kind. It regardless of color. It does, it's not the color. It's the drive and the push. How long have you been in an integrated school situation? Well, uh, I was <clears throat> put in the integrated and we, we integrated when I was in, passing to the fourth grade. You, you remember what it was like in the fourth grade when you went there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hate telling on TV, but uh, really, it was a big adjustment. You know, uh, you got into a couple of fights and everything, and like sometimes you'd, you'd be called a nigger or something. Uh, you you just feel like you you know you want to be back at the all black school because you weren't used to being around whites. Mm -hmm. And then you made the adjustment and you realized you know that this this was a part of life and things like this happened and you know you just had to go from there. Let's plan on having the test on this next Tuesday, and your test will be all problems unless I change my mind. Like Looking around your school, it seems that whenever you see uh, an advanced class, for example, the advanced physics class that you're in, uh, it's either all white or there's one black, maybe two. I think you're the only black in your physics class. Whenever you see a remedial class, it's 90% black, if yeah. not 100% black. I, I understand what you mean. It is that way at Tupelo High School. You know, I'm the only black in my physics, and there's two of us in the advanced math, and uh, I'm the only in, in the advanced science, you know. But uh, why is that? I guess it's a tendency that the, the blacks don't have, you know, don't make the grade point average that some of the white kids do. My father and mother are conscientious of my grades, you know, and uh, some of the kids' parents, I think, don't, stress grades, you know, and encourage them to be able to, you know, make better grades. Tupelo High Principal, Dr. Tom Cheney. How many Joe Washingtons are there? Well, Joe's an exceptional young man in many ways, and I, um, I, I, I think I know what you're driving at, and that is the, the uh, uh, general position of blacks uh, uh, relative to whites in the student body as far as academic achievements concerned, and uh, it, it's true that uh, the skew probably would, would be that the blacks are not uh, in as uh, strong a relative position as whites are in, uh, in our student body academically right now. Our observation and all of the research I know into, into this phenomenon uh, has, has been pretty much tied with the socioeconomic level of parents of the homes from which these youngsters come. How do you break that cycle? I mean, from generation to generation? Well, you just try like the devil, you know, all the time. I think everybody who encounters a student that they judge to be uh, operating at less than his potential works hard to, uh, to try to touch the right key. Robert Herford is assistant principal in charge of attendance. A lot of our children, especially blacks, come from low-income homes and where they don't have early childhood development where parents are so busy working. And a lot of them come from one family home, most of them the mother, that they don't have time to monitor their steady hours at night. And, uh, and they don't have enough people to push them, and they don't have enough models. When I talk about models, I'm talking about black male models in Tupelo. Okay, we already got the subject established. What is the subject? What's the subject? Although there are 13 black women teachers, there are no black males teaching academic courses full-time, no black counselors, and no black head coaches in the major sports. We want to pick them. We want to make them play defense for a while and see what they're going to be made out of. And it's going to be hard. A report by civil rights organizations which studied southern schools indicated that when black students see few blacks in positions of authority in the integrated schools, their motivation to learn is reduced. For black students at Tupelo High, integration has been a trade-off, a loss of black role models and control in return for much improved educational facilities. But the education here seems geared to middle-class students, white and black. So, although the Tupelo administration and faculty are first-rate, it is still likely that 
If a student is both black and poor, it would be difficult to break the cycle that entraps him. Those black students who are well motivated and probably middle class benefit most from integration. But even for successful students like Joe Washington Jr., there are still things you don't do at Tupelo. You ever go out with white girls? No, no, that's not allowed at Tupelo. That's 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 the biggest sin, you know, probably in Tupelo. You know, I guess I could if I wanted to, you know. I mean, some of them must be after you. You're yeah, uh, uh, bright, you. intelligent, star, <laughs> good looking. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess I could really if if, you, if I really wanted to, but you know, it's it's, it's not acceptable. It's Still. not liberal, right? It's not. A, Oh, uh, that would that that's the number one scene in, in Tupelo, I guess. What would happen know? if you did that? Well, first of all, probably I'd, I'd hit rock bottom. To tell you the truth, you know, if I was if I was to go out and you know and go out in public and you know just go like you know usually with a black girl you go to the hamburger joint or malt shop or go to the movies or something. If that was happen with a white girl, you would you you you'd get looked at for first of all. Then it'd get spread around and it'd get talked about. Then it get back to the businessman and probably be hard for you to get a job. You ever see things like that changing? <sighs> I think it'd be, a, it'd be a while before that change in Tupelo. Yeah. But the pace of change in Joe Washington's Tupelo is already faster than in some other parts of the state. In the small town of Lexington, the entire educational system has managed to sidestep the Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education. One, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, one, two, three, four, one. At the Lexington Attendance Center, there are 595 students and 27 teachers. But you won't find any white students here, or white teachers for that matter. They came here to the Center Homes Academy, one of three private schools in the county built in 1970. Why? Well, so that whites could avoid attending public schools, which had been forced to integrate under court order. White academies have sprung up all across the South, recreating segregated school systems, most frequently in districts where blacks are the majority. These recently established academies have often been criticized for providing what's called a second-rate education. Now, although Center Homes is considered one of the better academies, they still would not allow CBS reports to film in the school. In fact, according to two students, the principal here, Philip Chisholm, announced over the loudspeaker system that all students were forbidden to talk with us, even away from the school. Excuse me, sir. Are you Mr. Chisholm? Right. My name's Ed Bradley. I'm with CBS News. You're the principal of this school? Right. I wonder if we could talk to you for a couple of no, minutes. No, I don't. I don't think so. I have, I'm busy, man. I don't have any other thing to do. Well, just while you're just standing here, we, we were told by a couple of your students that uh, you told them over the intercom they shouldn't talk to any of us from CBS. wonder why you did that. Well, you had to talk to my students. You know. But, you know, you told them that. Why, why did you tell them that? Who said I told them that? You said I told the them that. The students told me that Well, you, you had to talk with the students. Did you say that? You, had, you said I said it. You had to ask the students. Well, I'm asking you. Did you? I'm not here interested in running the school rather than sitting and talking with y'all. I have other things to do. Did you give me a yes or no, did you? No, I don't have to answer you yes or no or anything. Can I ask you a question? What? Did uh, the principal tell you not to talk to anybody from CBS here? I don't know. Nothing about it. Tell me how you feel about going to school here. I ain't got no comment. Huh? I ain't got no comment. One possible reason for hostility and secrecy? The Internal Revenue Service has recently announced that these schools may have their tax exemptions revoked if it can be shown they are discriminating. Data on the number of academies, student population or performance is not made available by most of these schools. Estimates range between three and 4,000 academies for 750,000 white students in the South. Segregationist academies often have a damaging effect on public schools not only by denying all students a chance for integrated education where the races can learn from each other, but also by limiting financial resources available for public education. One example, class size is supposed to be limited by law to 28 students, but at Lexington, we saw several well over the limit. We talked to English teacher Marie Pringle. School officials tell us that the average class size in this school is 28. Well, I don't have any classes this year, unfortunately, of 28 students. And over My largest class consists of 49 students, which is really terrible. 
and my first two classes, I have anywhere from 42 to about 46 students. And then, too, we're only allowed $50 per year for purchasing material for students. And most of the time, we do not get the $50 worth of material. This is an age when men have both thought and eyes turned skyward. This is an age when we hear on every hand... Some students and teachers do overcome the handicaps of overcrowding and underfinancing. Being a black teacher, we can understand, too, uh, the problems which our black children encounter. And I believe that we know some of the problems that they will experience because we have encountered many of them. And we can try to show them and shelter them and be the parents when they need them because this is essentially what teachers are in a way. Teachers are often preachers because they have to provide spiritual guidance when there's none in the home. They have to be the counselor and uh, they sometimes become the bulldozer because they have to push the student along and try to show them the right direction. Okay, well why do we have the academies here? Because they don't want to be mixed. They want to stay with their own kind, just like I want to stay with mine. But I wouldn't mind going to a, a half and half situation. Maybe, yeah, like a school like Duran High. Predominant, you know, not predominant, neither way, half white and half black. Oh, you wouldn't mind that because... Uh-uh. But I wouldn't want to go to the academy, even if I could. Because uh, I think the same education I could get there, I could get with my black teachers here. Okay, do you think we'll have fewer discipline problems, say, if uh, we had an integrated situation here? I think there'll be more because right. eventually they're gonna they're gonna have conflicts because mm -hmm. we're black and they're white and that that's just the line right there. See, right. like a doctor's office, I could be just as sick as any other white person that's 17 <laughs> years old and that's my age, and I can go to the doctor's office and they're gonna put me in the back room and she's gonna take the front room and they're gonna call her first because I've been sitting up there two hours. <laughs> If the educational system is sidestepping the law, then some people are violating it. How you doing? Looking for Dr. Sinclair. I'm Dr. Sinclair. Could we talk to you for a minute, sir? Right now, I'm busy with a patient. Well, we're just kind of wondering why you have separate racial waiting rooms here. Well, it's been that way ever since I've been elected. You never thought of changing it? No, I never had done it, no, sir. But why do you keep the races separate? Isn't that against the law, sir? Not that I know of. Nobody's complained about it. Dr. Sinclair is in violation of the law. The local blacks have not taken legal action to stop him. Other segregated waiting rooms are maintained just down the hall by Drs. Bumbry and Campbell. For the black patients, a crowded, windowless, dark, shabby waiting room. No lamps, tables, magazines, just the absolute minimum. The white patients enjoy a sunny, airy waiting room with decent furniture and plenty of reading material. These doctors accept Medicaid funds and so are in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Dr. Campbell here. Yes, sir. Could we speak to him, please? No. Dr. Campbell? No. I didn't hear you, sir. Dr. Campbell? The doctor is here, is that correct? Yes, sir. He doesn't want to speak to us? No, sir. I see. Why do you have two separate waiting rooms here? No, I didn't want to talk to you. Which doctor are you going to say? I'm just going to get it. You're automatically going. Why don't you go in the other Have they always had one waiting room for, for whites and other ones for, for blacks here? It's always been that way? Yes. No change at all? Do you think that's right? Well, I'm afraid to say what's right, and I just come to the doctor. You just go along with it? Yes. Do you think you could change it? What would happen if you went in there and set the white waiting room? Uh, I don't think I'd go in there unless you know I had permission. You have to ask permission. Have you ever asked? Mm -mm. 
Lexington is not the only town to maintain links with its segregationist past, and the legacy of that past is economic inequality. But where overt racism has been eliminated, poverty generally has been diminished. Unfortunately, Mississippi is the poorest state in America. When members of both races are competing for jobs, the conflict reemerges. This is just what's happening in the small town of Lexington, where members of the United League are demonstrating for jobs. They are boycotting the town stores in what began as a protest over alleged police brutality. Now they want jobs, not only in the stores, but in the city government. The situation is tense, as I found out in Shore's Dry Goods Store, which has been on the square for over 50 years. The owner employs two blacks. We don't need a boycott because we've always treated everybody right. Black people get on very nicely here, and then that's stuff. Go down to your right about one mile and see the most gorgeous homes of, of, of black people in, in the United States. And our white homes in this in this this part of town and not equal to the others as far as homes are concerned. Is that for the majority of black people? Well, they, those who, who have it and want it. The government's taking care of they, they, they building beautiful homes. No one's suffering for, for homes. Is that right, Benny? That's right. And if you want some, you get it. If you don't, then you don't How get it. How about the beautiful homes around the black subdivision over there? That's right. They're as good as any, Mr. White, man. You can have it. You wish for it. But ain't nobody that's going to be out of blue sky and get to you. Well, they, these people from the United League are saying that they can't get the job. Can't get it. Man, this job right here, you can offer Maine uh, 10 or 12 dollars. He said the government said don't wait. Mm -hmm. That's what goes on. Mm -hmm. I'm 69 years old. I wouldn't tell you a lie. I raised 14 kids, seven girls and seven boys. I ain't starving. Mm -hmm. But you got to get out and work for it. But if you're going to walk around with a towel on your head, around your neck, you know you ain't going to have nothing. What, what about your 14 kids? What kind of jobs do they have? Oh, these are uh, in Chicago, California. They got good jobs. They didn't stay here, though. No, they after I, we, we had a big farm. This got two farm and it went on. Manager here, sir? Yes, sir. My name's Ed Bradley. Lord How are you? I'm from CBS in New York. We're in town for a few days trying to uh, to assess the impact of this boycott that they're having here. What impact has it had on your business? No comment. Why is that, sir? Don't care to talk. Why is that? It's not. The boycott appears effective. Sales are off and neither side is willing or able to compromise. The leader of the boycott is Arnett Lewis. We want all barriers of discrimination as far as jobs are concerned. We want black people hired into positions, key positions in the city government, and also key positions in, in, in all departments of the city government. Your water department, your street sanitation department, everything that the city is involved in, that reflects no composition of the black community. Later that day, I talk with Lexington's mayor, Billy Martin, who also owns a string of funeral homes. Are there blacks in responsible positions? Yes. Supervisory level? We have two supervisors in the city of Lexington. Uh, these men have been in these positions for many years. One is on the verge of retiring. Uh, both white. Both white. Uh, when and if this uh, man retires, and it's uh, within a year away, I basically already have the black supervisor picked out that's been with the city many years, has experience, and knows how to handle this job. Uh, I plan to advocate uh, putting him in this position. What about the sanitation department? You have a, a large number of blacks working in the sanitation department. That's correct. Are any of them uh, holding supervisory level jobs? Not at this point, no. We have a man in the water department that has been working in the water department for 50 years, and they hired a man with no experience over him I, as a supervisor. I they have, say maybe he's not qualified. <laughs> I have. Uh, they say maybe he's black. Basically, they want to uh, take over the city administration. And they can't do that through the electoral process, can they? They can do it when they get the votes. It's a free country. They don't have the votes. Support for the United League continues to grow. They are now protesting in 10 Mississippi towns, including here in Tupelo. Their most strident opponent is the Ku Klux Klan, more visible and more violent than they've been in some years. Estimated membership is said to be increasing by more than 100 a month. This group is supposed to be the most militant faction. 
They were holding a counter demonstration in Tupelo. I'd never interviewed a Klansman before, and approaching this armed group was not the most comfortable feeling. What are you going to do with this march the United League has today? I have no plans for the march of the United League today. Why, why is it necessary to, to have uh, sticks, clubs, weapons, and that sort of uh, Quite frankly, because I've been attacked on many occasions, and several weeks ago in Boston, every one of my bodyguards was ho hospitalized by the communists, uh, most of them white. Uh, the communists have been in Tupelo before on June the 10th. The communists are in Tupelo again today. Uh, I don't tend to be attacked without the retaliation. What does the plan stand for in 1978? We stand for white supremacy, we stand for a free enterprise, we stand for a white America. Under a free enterprise system, isn't that contradictory to white supremacy? I mean, no. does a free enterprise allow anyone to rise up through the system? That's right. However, the Black white, or white? That's right. However, the white race being superior, we will control the country again. The white race is superior. Absolutely. It was not the fanaticism of the Klan that drove blacks out of the South in the last 25 years, but rather a major shift in the economy. Black Southerners were hard hit by mechanization of the farms. During the 1960s, agricultural employment for blacks in Mississippi decreased by 72%. During that same period, the South experienced an industrial boom, but that was centered in urban areas. Out in the country where most blacks live, there was little improvement. The jobs that did open up were usually in low-wage, non-union industry like this new plant in Lexington, which manufactures electrical components for cars. It employs 103 blacks, three of them as mid-level supervisors. But it pays workers on the line just 50 cents an hour above the minimum wage, and they're not unionized. Company president, Ron Zadroga. My, my personal belief here is that people don't need a union here. Uh, we, we represent the area as far as wages are concerned, and it, we give them a nice place to work and decent working conditions is what I'm saying, and we treat them rather nicely. What, what about all this talk you hear about the New South? Minnie Huntley, a volunteer with a community action group, works with the rural poor. We have the same problem we've been had 25 years ago. Race poverty, hunger, the lack of medical attention, and all the things that goes with poverty, we still have it here in the South. 20 years ago, white families in Lexington and its county earned four times more than blacks. Today, they earn three times as much. The fact is that Mississippi is still the poorest state in America for blacks and whites. But the unemployment rate is four times higher for blacks. One third of the black population depends on food stamps. 39% of Lexington's housing is substandard. Most of it black occupied. They stay says, sometimes like on the weekend. Oh, they're not. I joined Miss Huntley on one of her regular visits to a black neighborhood. These houses look like the prisons used to live 20, 30, 40 years ago. Those old long shotgun houses with three rooms, just walk through it, one, two, three rooms. No running water, no bath. The house is completely falling apart and the white man charge him $60 a month. What kind of help do you get from the state? $189.40. Mrs. Mary Moore is disabled and lives on federal supplemental security income. Can I ask you how old you are? Would you run? Yes, sir. I'd be, I'd be 43 of the ninth of this month. Uh, you have children? Yes, sir. Where, they, where would they be? A day is up now. They would like to have me, but they have a big family they stay up. So you're you're here by yourself? Yes, sir. Yes. And you can't work because of the operation you have? That's right. And I have the heart trouble, and then I have the diabetes, you know, sugar. And then I have the high blood pressure. So I, I couldn't tell the person that I would give them, you know, a day's whip because sometimes I feel good and then sometimes I don't. So, but it was a long time before I, you know, got on, you know, this It's hard. It's okay. It's okay. What What is it that makes your life so hard? Well, because I, 
I just ain't, you know, never had what I wanted. You know what I mean, Mister? What I want, you know, a decent place to live. And you understand, you know, just you want to live like a human being, live in something, but like this. CBS reports will continue. Give us the ballot. And we will no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. Give us the ballot. And we will no longer plead to the federal government for passage of an anti-lynching law. We will, by the power of our vote, write the law on the statute books of the South and bring an end to the dastardly acts of the hooded perpetrators of violence. Give us the ballot. Civil rights leaders demanded the right to vote. That was crucial to achieving full equality. 25 years after Brown versus the Board of Education and 14 years after the Voting Rights Act, more than 2 million Southern black voters have been added to the rolls. 2,700 blacks have been elected to office in the South even to an office in the court, which historically had presided over and preserved the system of segregation. Order in court. All rise. No smoking, please. The county court of the First Judicial District, Pines County, Mississippi, is now in session. The Honorable Reuben B. Anderson presiding. In 1978, Reuben Anderson was elected the first black county judge in Mississippi history. Finish ready. Okay. You gentlemen care to make an opening statement? To have grown up in Mississippi in the 50s and in the 60s and then see Mississippi in the latter part of the 70s is, uh, is just a great difference in terms of the progress that uh, both black and white people have made together in a lot of things. When I was growing up, there were three black lawyers in the state of Mississippi, so you can obviously see that there were not any black judges. That was one of the problems that a lot of black people had, that they never saw people in professions where they would aspire to those positions. And these things uh, have completely changed. Mississippi now has well in excess of 100 black lawyers. And if any group of people have changed Mississippi, it's been lawyers and black lawyers who have fought the battles, uh, who fought to integrate the schools and the public accommodation facilities. When I was growing up in high school, I was afraid to even walk at night other than black neighborhoods. Uh, the parks that you see around Jackson, I never walked in them at all while I was a child. I never walked through them. Where? I had the fear that if I did, I'd be killed. Blacks have made impressive political gains, but even today, they hold less than 1% of the elective offices in the country, and there are only two members in Congress elected from the states of the old Confederacy. Last October, we came to Addison Junior High School in Port Gibson, 65 miles south of Jackson, to follow the campaign of a man intent on becoming the first black elected to the U.S. Congress from Mississippi since Reconstruction. He is 30-year-old Evan Doss, who is running as an independent for the 4th Congressional District, which is 43% black. Thank you. I'd like to get mad. Thank you. He hopes his Democratic and Republican opponents will split the white vote between them while he is capturing 85% of the black vote and an upset victory. To announce the Mozilla character and $25 for Ross Club. Will you all stand let them know that our community club who is behind all our candidates. Today, he raised $700 in his hometown. If the number to say something like that on that money, I ain't got no problem here, Clayton County, <laughs> because we must go out. And it's important that we go out on November the 7th. Well, you see, we can win this election, but we got the Bible on our side. It says that a divided house cannot stand. And you see, they will be divided. For there will be a Republican on one side 
and there'll be a Democrat on the other side. Yes. All we got to do is stick together and go straight on up the middle on November the 7th. Yes. Yes. And when you go to the polls on November the 7th, if you like Evan Doss, put a big X in the parenthesis. And if you dislike Evan Doss, put a small X in the parenthesis. Thank you very much. Sir. no one home here. Doss's Republican opponent, John Henson, has spent $221,000 in a state that has rarely elected a Republican to statewide office. You're running for Congress. You're running against black opposition. You're actively seeking black votes. Is that a change, a political change in this state from your early days? Well, certainly a change from the time I was growing up. Um, I think that's an affected by many things. I think the uh, civil rights legislation that is on the books, the fact that black people are voting in bigger numbers, uh, has certainly made uh, any candidate for office, whether he be black or white, more conscious of the uh, participation of, uh, of black people. In Woodley, an upper middle class integrated Jackson neighborhood, one out of four homes is black owned. Today, the Democratic candidate has come here seeking black votes. He is John Hampton Stennis, son of longtime U.S. Senator John C. Stennis. I don't know. Um, I hadn't got, it's against the law to promise anybody a job, but I'm sure going to have uh, my staff is going to reflect, my executive staff will reflect uh, racial balance and sexual balance between men and women, black and white. Blacks have always supported the Democratic ticket, but with black candidate Doss running, the crucial black vote is now in question for the first time. Although political influence has increased significantly, economic gains have been minimal. Wealthy blacks in Mississippi are still unusual. Less than 1% of black families earn $25,000 or more a year. Some of the richest live here in Woodley, and they still have long memories. Are you really considering voting for John Hampton's family? I would have to say no. Why would you say that? Well, I was with Mega in his struggle for civil rights, and I was also out there with Charles Evans. Now, and I know what it means to have the um, high... What it means to have the dogs turned loose on you. I know what it means when I got ready to move to Woodley to said that we won't have blacks out here. When we leave the ghetto or leave the other side of the track or whatever you want to call it, then it's up to, to the leaders that leave to stimulate that interest in those that are left behind, but we can't do it by saying, okay, I made it out, I have my education, you know, I'm living in Woody, I'm living, you know, with the elite class, you know, so then I'm not concerned because I know where we came from and I know where we are now. And I still know what it means, you know, for the black boys and girls still to be denied, you know. Just because we have our foot in the door don't mean regardless of whether that white can produce or not, but we still got to stand together. I'm considering all of the candidates. I have not given a personal endorsement to no candidate. And when I go behind that booth, nobody will know how I voted other than me. Hi, man. Don't y'all forget Evan Doss now. Okay. All right, don't y'all forget Evan Doss. It's election day in Jackson. Doss, who is relatively unknown to voters, campaigns at various polling places. This is illegal in Mississippi, but Doss feels this kind of electioneering is his best chance to influence the voters. How you doing, sir? The Civil Rights Commission observed that regulations which prohibit electioneering at polling places are unfair to minority candidates. Yeah, okay, fine, we're going out there. Well, those stickers, they're uh, supposed to be 30 feet from the building if you're giving out any kind of literature, whatever. Well, I haven't you know, decided yet to give out well, anything. I haven't decided yet to give out anything. Well, yeah. all right, just, just be sure that, uh, that you're Excuse 30 me, where's feet. Where's the Where's the 30 foot mark here? Well, from the building, that's from the what building, they were, from the building. Uh -huh. That'd be about right here. Well, I don't know. I haven't measured it off, uh -huh. but it's supposed to be 30 feet. That's what we were told in instructions. Okay, is he okay right here? I don't have a ruler to measure it off, but just use your own judgment. It's supposed to be 30 feet. Does that look like about 30 feet? Yeah. About 30 out here, so I <laughs> It's tough down here in the center. <laughs> Doss spent $8,000 on his campaign. His opponents each spent 20 times that. 
And in Stinna's case, at least some of that money was shrewdly spent hiring blacks to distribute his campaign literature in the black neighborhoods on election day. Who are you campaigning for? Charles Evers. Charles Evers? Yes. But you're passing out Stinna's literature. Well, I'm getting paid for to do this one, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of him not charge it. You want him to be your representative in Washington? Nope. Then why are you passing out his literature? I'm paid. I'm getting paid to do that. Do you know who this man is? Who? This man right here. Oh. Uh, Evan Doss. Evan Doss. Oh, yeah. Who's Evan Doss? <laughs> well, I didn't know it. Who is he? <laughs> I don't know. What's he running for? I don't know. You don't know? You seriously don't know Evan Doss is running against John Hampton Stennis. Oh. You know that, don't you? You know that. Oh, well, I know it now. You know it now? Mm-hmm. But what about your ad campaign? I mean, did you have television commercials and all that? Uh, we didn't really have you know, uh, te television because, see, what happened? We primarily went to house-to-house -to -house time campaigning. I think that, you know, if, if they had a choice of who would they work for between Evan Doss and Stennis, you know, say no money was involved, you know, I'm confident that they would go with Evan Doss. But Stennis is able to pay this kid to go out and pass out his literature. Yeah. Whereas Evan Doss is not able. Okay. Here in Jackson, there has already been a winner declared. A Republican John Henson has apparently won the <laughs> state representative John Hampton Stennis of Jackson. For Evan Doss, watching early returns with his family and small staff, defeat, but a respectable 24,000 votes, 19% of the total cast, and the dubious distinction of spoiling the chances for Democratic victory. Evan Doss is going to say to his staff to rest for now, but we definitely will be back again on the political track. Lack of resources is one obstacle facing black candidates. Another is gerrymandering, that is, drawing election district lines with the intent to minimize black voting strength. Henry Kirksey, civil rights activist and newspaper publisher, shows how it works in the city of Picayune, Mississippi. Most of the blacks who live in this county, uh, just over 3,000, live right here in the city of Picayune, the largest city in the county. Now, as you can see, this is a uh, county district. We call them beats. County district number one is in the northeast corner of the county, but it has this long 27-mile-long leg that's one mile wide running down into the city of Picayune. Now you have beat number two, also with a leg running into Picayune. Now, this takes right here. is predominantly black. It goes right to the black concentration within the city of Picayune. And out of that one hardcore black area, they take little bits for five districts. That's right. To dilute the exactly. black voting strength. That's true. Is that an exception? Do you see this in other counties in Mississippi? There are 25 black majority counties, or were, 1970 census. Every one of them is like that. But in small towns with heavy black majorities immune to gerrymandering, blacks have been elected to office. Bolton, Mississippi. Population, 527 blacks, 260 whites. It is one of 18 small towns in the state with a black mayor. This mayor has earned a reputation as a politician who delivers. Where previous white administrations did not even seek federal aid, he was able to secure more than $6 million in various government grants. Today is a very important day in Bolton. Groundbreaking for a million dollar federally funded 40 unit apartment development. The man who put it all together is the 31 year old mayor, Benny Thompson. There's a lot of symbolism in this development. Number one is that the 40 units will be owned by persons living in the Bolton community. Occupancy will be based on persons living in the Bolton community. Plus, it represents the single largest black economic development venture that has ever taken place in Hines County. We were able to borrow $1,056,418 toward the development of this project. That project will mean a number of jobs to people in this community and its construction. But in the end, it will also mean that we will be able to provide decent housing for 40 families.
Mrs. Addie Henderson won't be living in this shack for much longer. She'll be moving into the new apartment in the fall. Mrs. Henderson, Ed Bradley is my name. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. How old are you, man? I'm 91 years old. 91 years old? Yes. 91 years old. Well, you get around well for your age. Yeah. How long have you lived here? I've been here about 29 years. 29 years in this in this one place? Yes, sir. Yeah. And been here, I, I would, would want my house on the front. Yeah, it's going to be on the front. What do you think about this man here, the mayor? Oh, he's all right. He's good. Yes, sir. That's your neighbor? Yes, sir. That's your neighbor? Yes, sir. Both, both of those ladies. Both of you be moving over there? Yeah. Yes, sir. But I want my house on the front. Why, why do you want it on the front? I don't want to live on no back. Now, she's 91 years old. Um, she registered when she was 81 years old to vote. She had never voted? Never voted before. And uh, because she's been able to relate to what we're trying to do in this community, when election time comes around, you don't have to worry about Ms. Addy. Ms. Addy will be there. She's going to call you, tell her what time to pick her up and everything. Is it that way with a lot of people in this town now? There's more interest in, in the political process? Quite a bit more interest uh, because they can see a difference. Thompson has made a difference. With the federal grant money, he's created 80 new jobs, many special programs for the elderly and preschoolers. He's doubled the size of the now all-black police force. He's built a new fire station and this new city hall where today the citizens of Bolton sing the black national anthem to celebrate the town's latest achievement. In the 25 years since that historic Supreme Court decision, Mississippi, as well as the rest of the country, has moved forward. 25 years ago, I would have never been able to have filmed this report there. I'd have been run out of town or worse. Realistically, how fast can you expect racism and bigotry to die? If you're black, it can never be too fast. But as Joe Washington points out, it will be a long time before everything changes. Tomorrow night, I'll be visiting my hometown, Philadelphia, to see what has happened there 25 years after Brown versus the Board of Education. Why can't I get work? I beg them, please give me some work. That's all I ask, nothing else. They give them free homes from birth to death. Everything's paid for. Education, medical, homes, you name it, it's paid for. I want to be known. You know, they say, oh, yeah, we know her. You know, that's how I want I want to say, oh, her, you know. I say, oh, her, you see. For CBS Reports, I'm Ed Bradley. Good night. In June, two months after CBS News reported to the federal government the existence of the segregated doctor's offices in Lexington, the walls dividing black and white waiting rooms were taken down, and the signs reading colored and white were removed.